real plants in there. It is, it's beautiful. She's done a great job. Then she's also been, uh, you know, putting plants all around the house. And so if you notice when I walk now, it's just, it's just, I don't know, it's just natural, but I tend to do this all the time. So I'm not trying to walk. So, so that's why if you've wondered as of late, I'm going like this is because of all the plants around the house, Brenda. So I'm just having to, it's just, it's just a habit now. So anyway, so we got all that. How many fish do you have? So we have over a hundred fish, three, and the deal was if we were going to have, you know, three German shepherds, they're German shedders. I'm the, I'm the honorary vacuum guy. So I, I get to vacuum. I vacuum every day. Can I hear somebody say, oh, oh, you're clapping. <laughs> That's great. All right. Hey, I want to do this. Uh, I don't know if you've heard, but uh, there is a new mask uh, mandate that um, they are uh, going to, uh, put in place. And uh, yeah, I know it's every time that you pump gas, you're to now put your mask over your eyes. So you don't, you don't see any, uh, you don't see any, uh, don't see the gas prices. So that's the new mandate. Put, put the mask over your eyes and it should be real good. Hey, I want to do this. I know we're making a lot of announcements. I want to get right to it, but I want you to join me uh, April 21st to the 22nd, Mario Murillo, uh, maybe center. How many ever been there? Tulsa, Oklahoma. They are now nearing 6,000 registrants. It can hold like 9,000. I'm telling you, we're going to pack the place out. And I want to show you a picture of why being in the right place before you put it up. Let me explain it. Uh, being in the right place. So I was 22 years of age was the last time that I was at the Maybe Center. And uh, Brother Kenneth Copeland was preaching. And I had no clue that uh, I was 22. So 34 years later, because I'm almost going to be 56 in May, that I would be on a, on a platform with, with Pastor Gene Bailey, Mario Murillo, Lance Walnow, Brother Copeland's going to be there. I never thought, so being in the right place at the right time, you get impartations that you don't even realize will affect others in your future. So I want you to see this. Now, go ahead and put up the picture. This is me at 22. Yeah. I had long hair. Notice that was called the Moses hairstyle, where there's a part of the Red Sea that goes down the middle, just like the Red Sea, one to the right, to the left. So I was so stirred up. Brother Copeland was preaching about being stirred up, and I was so stirred up, they caught me. Isn't that amazing? And people have told me that. It looks like Matthew, doesn't it? But then again, if with a beard, it kind of looks like Jesus. I'm only teasing. But anyway, he's preaching. But that's, so I want you to join us. Now, if you notice, how many of you notice the part in the middle? The Moses hairstyle. Now, you know what my hairstyle is today? It's the Elijah hairstyle. Where it's parted to the side. The side that parts ways from the false, fake prophets of Baal called the fake news today. And the side that sides with God. There you go. All right. Let's open our Bibles. I just made that up. <laughs> Somebody goes, yeah, we know. We're used to those jokes. We know every week. All right, here we go. I want you to open up to Isaiah chapter 10, verse 27. And uh, I want to talk, and, and those of you that are watching today, about the anointing of preservation. So we've been talking about the anointing of God. And if you remember, we talked about how the anointing is God himself coming upon human flesh. Yes. Extraordinary or extraordinary or supernatural. That's what the anointing does. And so we've been teaching about how do you get that anointing? How do you increase that anointing? But you know, as I was studying, God kept dealing with me about how many remember when God was declaring in fact, August 16th, I've shared it on Flashpoint many times, the word of the Lord that came from this platform, August 16th of 2020. God, do you think, do you think that they're going to steal my nation from me? How many remember that prophetic word? Raise your hand. August 16th, 2020. Thank you. Those of you that are watching as well. But one of the things that he prophesied, and you might've heard uh, me say this, and I didn't quite understand it until I started diving into the anointing, the study uh, on the anointing, the Lord began to deal with me. God prophesied in that time that no matter what they would try to do to our nation, that there was something upon this nation that God put because of the prayers of the people, but also our forefathers. And he said it was an anointing of preservation. How many remember that? So I thought, well, God, it's so many crazy stuff, gas prices, inflation, crazy things going on. How can our, our nation be protected in this anointing of preservation and does the anointing preserve those are my questions so you're going to find that god does preserve through 
really two ways. Your covenant first and foremost. How many of you have a covenant with Jesus? Yes. Amen. Now, here's how you know. Romans chapter 10, 9 and 10, the Bible says that uh, if you believe and you confess with your mouth that he is Lord, your Lord, you shall be what? Saved. saved. So that word saved is more than just forgiveness of sin, eternal life. Then it says in Romans 10, you go down further in verse 13. And if they put up on the screen, it says, and whoever calls on the name of the Lord. How many of you called on the name of the Lord? I did in 1984. Shall be what? Saved. We think that means forgiveness of my sins. Oh, wretched sinner is me. And we think that that's the only thing it means. Forgiveness of sin. I get a mansion in heaven. I get to go to heaven. But we don't realize that that word saved is a bigger deal. It's a bigger passage. How many ever heard of that scripture in the book of Romans that says the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus? So we think because it says free gift and it mentions eternal life, the free gift must just be eternal life. No, the free gift is what you read in Romans 10, 13. It is not just eternal life. It literally is in the Greek, the word sozo. S-O-Z-O, and it means forgiveness of sins. It means healing of your body. So you've already been healed. People, when we're trying to get healed, it's already been established. That's why the Bible says you are already healed. It's part of your free gift package. Long life is part of your sozo. No, not if it's according to the curse. Because it would violate your sozo rights package. Prosperity. You can say, I don't believe in the health and wealth gospel. Well, then you don't believe in what you received with your free gift. It's not just forgiveness of sin. Healing, wholeness, soundness of mind, a blessed memory, rescue from any harm and danger, and protection, but also preservation. That's part of your package deal. Now, there's something also that's part of that. It's called the anointing of preservation. How do you get that anointing of preservation? How do you get that anointing on your life that preserves you? How many times have you read in scripture where the Bible says that the devil could not touch Jesus? Now you may say, well, the reason they couldn't touch him is because he was the son of God. No, Jesus laid down his life. But there were several attempts on Jesus' life. And I'm going to show you either Wednesday night when I preach or next Sunday. That there were, then they can, they can do what they're going to do to my body as I take the curse and I become sin. So that you can become the blessing. So what you have to understand is there was something that happened to Jesus. In Luke chapter 4, and you, and you go before Luke 4 where he was baptized. And the Bible says the spirit of the Lord came on him at the time of his baptism in the river Jordan by John the Baptist. I mean, remember that. The Bible says that the spirit of God came upon him and he was full of the Holy Spirit. Then we read that the first thing that, that, that happens, a man filled with the spirit now is driven into the wilderness, it says. In the book of Luke, chapter 4, verse 1, by the Spirit of God. So God's the one driving Jesus into the wilderness to have conflict, to have warfare with the devil. And, 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 and it's, to it's over with. No, it's to produce an anointing. It's to produce the power of God, which will destroy the very thing that has been attacking you. All this stuff that's going on in the... And there's an anointing of preservation upon the United States because of the harvest of souls that will be won for Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. So think about this. Jesus then goes into the wilderness, and the Bible says in Luke 4, verse 16, that then Jesus came out of that wilderness, watch this, in the power of the Spirit of the living God. So now Jesus has this power on him, and he goes in to the temple... And he goes into the very place at the age of 13 and maybe many more times. And he was, he was received of them. They, Luke chapter 2 said that he was a asking questions. And he was also speaking to them. And nobody tried to take his life. But the minute he opens his mouth and he knows his Bible, he opens the book. And he happens to turn it now to Isaiah. 
And he reads out of the book, Jesus does, and he says, all right, everybody, look at me. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, and he has anointed me. From that moment that he said that, he activated the anointing of protection or preservation until he laid hair out of your mouth. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. I am anointed. Do you know you are bringing preservation? Watch this. Watch this. Why the minute, you know, we often talk about, remember Miriam and Aaron. In the Old Testament, they talked against their brother Moses. And Miriam got leprosy. God just picking on a woman. Because nothing seemed to happen to Aaron. Except if you keep reading, he did get punished. God said to him, Stand before me, Aaron. And he said, take off your priestly anointing or your garment. Soon as, as long as he was under that anointing that preserved his life, his life, he lived. But once that mantle was removed, in fact, the 50 sons of the prophets knew it, but they were so busy, caught up in whatever. And they're like a lot of preachers. They stayed on the other side of the river waiting to see if there might be any validity to the prophetic words. And they won't be part of the double portion that God's pouring out on those prophets that have been standing and saying it regardless of what it looks like. So here's what happens. Once Elisha's taken up into heaven, what happens to his mantle? Falls on the ground. What happens to his life? He's in heaven. What happened to Jesus? The gamblers are down there. They grab his garment. A seam, a robeless seam. It was his type of his mantle. And it was divided in four parts. Why four parts? Because the Bible speaks in Ephesians 4.11 of the fivefold ministry. But really it's the fourfold ministry. But the apostle covers all of it or functions in all of this. So the four parts speak of the fourfold ministry of the pastor teacher, the, the, the prophet, and the apostle. How many get this? And so once they parted his garments and took his garments, what did he do? He got caught up into heaven. So the anointing is what preserves and protects your life. That's why if you're a preacher, you live right. You live holy. Because if God decides to pull that mantle off of you because of your, your lack of, 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 of right living and your choices... Your ministry. So the anointing preserves you. Well, how do I keep that anointing on me? It's what Jesus did. He said, look at me. The spirit of God is upon me. I am anointed. Now, do you know what happened? That's Luke chapter 4. But do you know what happened? You keep reading in Luke chapter 4. And you will find out that Jesus absolutely makes the doctors of the law, the scribes and Pharisees, so vehemently angry. Because he says, listen, boys. He closes the book. He says, all right, today I'm that man. This has been fulfilled in your hearing. I am the anointed one. Yeah. Then he goes on and he says, by the way, Israel, but I didn't go to any of those widows. I only went to one that was a Gentile. Then he goes on and says, you know, there were many of those. I was only sent to one, a Gentile. And they rose up. And they were so angry, verse 28 says, they were filled with wrath. That they literally let him out, keep reading, and they rose up, they thrust him out. Because what Jesus was saying is, look, I'm your Messiah. I'm the anointed one that I just declared. And I'm sent to you, your Messiah, so guess what I'm going to have to do? I'm going to have to go and bring it to the Gentiles first. And they got mad. Oh, did they get mad. And they got so angry, they rose up to try to thrust him out of the city. And they somehow got a hold of him and led him to the brow. Wow, but why could they not throw him down? Notice headlong. If you're going to throw somebody down off a cliff headlong. You're... But he passed through the midst of them. <laughs> Supernaturally. It's like, he's just like, you can't touch this. I'm anointed. <laughs> They're like, and I could just see it now. You dummy, you just let him go. I had him in my grass, boss. <laughs> but there was an anointing. And he passed through because of the anointing that preserved his life. But he passed through the midst of the winds way. Now watch this in verse 31. Why? 
Why? He came down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and taught them there on the Sabbath days. Verse 32. And they were astonished at his doctrine, for his words or word was with what? Power. And part of that power that came from the word was the word that he declared in the verses before. Look at me. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. I am anointed. And that, and you know what it did? It brought the Spirit of God on him, that anointing. The anointing preserves you. All right, look at Isaiah chapter 10. We've been talking about this. Now look at Isaiah chapter 10. I'm going to prove to you from this scripture right here that the anointing will preserve your life. This is why don't you go around and repeat what the fake news is wanting you to believe. Don't you dare start talking negative over your life because what you'll do is the opposite. You'll release uh, a negative anointing. Demonic powers will start operating against you. Don't do it. When you declare, that's why I don't watch the news, when you declare, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. When you connect to anointed things like your Bible, you absolutely are protecting and preserving your life. You know why? Listen to me. Why did it say, see, people get on me. They say, well, you're just a holiness preacher. No, I'm a biblical preacher. I'm a righteous preacher. Because, listen, the noun can, can mess you up. People getting around the wrong associations, people. Getting involved in the wrong places, right? And getting involved in the wrong things can make you susceptible to that anointing on your life. And then now the enemy comes and takes a crack at you, right? He seeks who he can destroy. One of the ways that the lion goes about, or the enemy goes about like a roaring lion, seeking who he may devour, is he's looking. Can I get access? But if you have an anointing around you and upon you, it's harder. That's why the Bible says about Jesus, the devil, it says in Scripture, could find nothing in Jesus. That anointing stayed on him. Because of his lifestyle, how he talked, how he acted, what he chose to do. And it kept this preservation upon him. That no matter how many times the enemy came at him, he couldn't touch him. Look at Isaiah 10. I'm going to show you. In Isaiah 10, it says, and it shall come to pass in that day. that Now think of an ox as you're, as you're, as you're hearing this. It shall come to pass in that day. That his burden shall be taken away from off thy shoulder. So this ox is going to have the burden taken off of his shoulder. And his yoke shall get off of his neck. And the yoke shall not... You don't want the anointing to break the yoke. Because if the anointing just breaks the yoke, it means it can be put back together and you can be yoked again. You want the anointing to do what the scripture says. From the yoke shall be, dis- means literally busted into so many fragments, pieces, so small you couldn't even find it to even put it back together again. Serving the Lord. Because I release an anointing over it. Amen. My business is blessed because I connect it to the anointing. This church is blessed because I connect it to the anointing. Amen. If you're a businessman, you really do need to connect to the, your, your business to the anointing. The Shunammite woman, come on, in 2 Kings, uh, I believe it's 4, she connected to Elisha. And here she was barren. She couldn't even get pregnant. Received and connected to the anointing. The Bible says that she, about a year later, according to the words of the prophet speaking, she connected that anointing. Something began to be birthed. As a business person or a Christian, when you connect to the anointing, that's why tithing, you should connect to it because it's an anointed principle. Giving is an anointed principle. I've taught you before that when you give, you activate the supernatural. You either activate heaven or you activate hell. Your lack of giving activates the enemy. He brings poverty. He brings the curse. Things start breaking down. Nickel and dime in you. But once you start giving, it activates the supernatural to take care of whatever the enemy would try to do. That's why the Bible says if you tithe, he opens the windows of heaven. There's a supernatural connection and rebukes the devourer. There's the supernatural countering of the enemy that tries to come against you so when you're a businessman or whatever you connect to the anointing you know Brent and i almost uh, try every day to pray together every day we try every day to take communion together why because it's not just about a physical connection it's about a spiritual connection in the anointing that enhances the emotional the physical and other areas of your life don't go to cactus christian center 
Tomb Raider, uh, relevant, whatever. Right? Because whatever you connect to will get on you. Y'all ain't amen and very good, and I'm preaching really, really good. So when you connect to the anointing, okay, what about Mark chapter 5, the woman with the issue of blood? The Bible says that she had an issue. Some, people, some people's issues are, uh, you know, uh, health issues or whatever. But do you know when you connect to that which is anointed, just like the woman who had an issue of blood connected, she said, if I could just touch those anointed garments of Jesus, I, she didn't say might, she said, I'll be made whole. Amen. Man, if I just connect to this anointed church, something of God is going to happen. Now let's go back to the ox. In Isaiah chapter 10, notice what it says again. In you, there's an anointing of preservation. Watch this. So the yoke, so imagine this yoke. You've all seen it coming on an ox. And imagine this, this, this big old yoke being upon this, this ox. Shall be, watch this, destroyed because of what? Amen. Now, the literal translation in the Hebrew is not just anointing. It's the word fatness. So because that ox is so fat, so muscular, so blessed being submitted to its master. Hello, you're that ox. Nothing can be yoked upon him. No perversion. It cannot touch that Christian ox. So what does that mean? He's so anointed. He's so fat in the anointing and the blessing of God and the blessing of Sozo that I just showed you. That the enemy cannot put anything on him. It cannot Stick and it will not last. That, my friend, is preservation. Your life is preserved. That's what Jesus said in John 10. He said, man, the devil comes and comes to destroy. And then Jesus stops and he says, but I want to show you a distinction. This is why don't offend God. Grieve it. Whatever. You as the Lord, give it and the Lord, take it away. And the Lord looks at you and says, Lord, you're, in, you're ignorant. Jesus, on purpose in John 10, made a distinction. He doesn't back, Jesus doesn't back up from nothing. He moves his foot forward and says, now listen to me, boys. But I have come to give you something different. I've come to give you life and life more abundantly. What's part of that life? Sozo. It's whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be sozo, shall be blessed, shall be healed, shall live long, shall be protected, shall be rescued, shall be guarded, shall be healthy. Come on, shall be preserved. And when you declare out of your mouth, your souls will rise, but then follow it up because the, 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 the word is anointed. When you go around saying, hey, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. I am anointed. You know what you're doing? You're bringing this power, the spirit of God himself upon you. And there's an anointing of preservation released. And just like that ox, nothing can touch you. That's why MC Hammer said you can't touch this. You cannot touch it when it is has the anointing upon it. It won't stick. It won't last. Amen? All right, let's go on. Now look at what your, what your rights are, Isaiah 54. We quote this all the time in verse 17. It says, no weapon, okay? No weapon means what? None. Come on, all you Catholics. None. Former Catholics, none. By the way, do you know that Joshua's mom was a Catholic nun. It's what the scripture says. I don't know how that works. I don't get it. But she was a Catholic nun because the Bible says that, that Joshua was the son of nun. That's what the Bible says. I don't know. I don't get it. I can't figure that out. But anyway, there you go. Stay with the Bible. But here, here's the deal. So no weapon, none means none. No means no. Right? No weapon, who's forming it against you? The devil. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. Why? Well, let's keep reading. And those that talk against you, criticize you, judge you falsely, you have a responsibility not to get on and argue. That's why I don't comment to trolls because I would, I would, I would, I would, I would, never mind. I'm not going to tell you what I would do, but I would do something. And so here's the thing. But what I do is I condemn it. 
That has no power. That has no effect. <laughs> then you put another life in there. <laughs> okay, so you're going to write about me. So I, <laughs> I condemn it. Shoe fly, don't bother me. Right? So you got to be, oh, so-and-so is talking about me. They're so mean. Type in the name Jesus. And that's saying all kinds of crazy things about your Lord. You're in good company. But no weapon formed against you shall prosper. And any word that would rise up and be spoken against you in judgment, what are you supposed to do? You're to condemn it. Why? Because your sozo rights, or do you know what the name Christian means? Christ-like, it means anointed. You are a little anointed one. Why do you think Jesus said in John 14, he said, look at me, boys. The works that I do, you're going to do too. Because I go to the Father. Amen. Are you listening? That's what he said. The works that I do, you're going to do. Because what did they call Jesus? The what? The Christ. Christ means anointed. That's not his last name. Jesus, the anointed one. Why do you think Matthew 24, it says that in the last days that they're going to be deception. That's going to be many false Christs. What false Christs are? Things that you think is the anointing, but it's not. Right? Preachers who think being relevant with the woke culture and people stay in those kind of churches. That's a false Christ. That's a false anointing. This user-friendly movement that really set the church so nice, so inviting, so about your coffee, and not about the Holy Ghost. It got everybody being so compliant, so agreeable, that, that they shut down their churches. And you're wondering, where, where is the church? So you have to understand there's a lot of things that people think who goes to the cemetery and comes out with homiletics and he floats around like a little fairy and a, and a sissy and his words have no power on him. He doesn't want to offend anybody. He doesn't want to say anything that's going to make you mad or challenge you. I mean, who wants that kind of pastor? I don't want that kind of pastor. America doesn't need that kind of pastor. But yet they're the ones that produce the, oh, we, we can't vote for the guy with mean tweets. It's true. And we got to be smart because when it comes to the anointing, you got to go after it. And you got to recognize it. That's why I love our online church, man. There's people that are going, you know what? I can't find a church in my city. Well, welcome to your church then. This is your church. Because I wouldn't connect because what you connect to comes on you. All right. So where was I at? Where's that? Oh, so Isaiah 54. This is your heritage. This is your right as a Christian. Okay? It's your right as a Christian, as servants of the Lord, that no weapon formed against you will prosper. It isn't going to touch you. Now, how important is the anointing? Look at Zechariah chapter 4. Look at verse 6. It says, this is Zechariah now. He's prophesying. He said, look, it's not by your human ability. It's not by your power or your own strength, but notice what we need. We need the anointing, but it's by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. So how important is the anointing? It's so important that the prophet says, man, it's not about your own human ability. It's not about your own strength. It's about God and his spirit. Now look at Acts 10, 38. What is the source of this anointing that preserves us? Watch this. Look at how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth. With the Holy Ghost and with power. So what was the source of his power? What was the source of his anointing? The Holy Ghost. What's going to be your source? The Holy Ghost. When God's spirit rests on you, when his anointing rests on you, there's a preservation, there's a protection. And he went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. So who was oppressing people? Jesus said in John 10 that we said, but notice he went about doing good. You know, every time Jesus said to forgive, that's a good thing. Every time that he, um, he said, sin no more, that's a good thing. When they came and, 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 uh, you know, they, and he wrote something in the sand, probably their names. And when they were with that woman, right, that's good. He, Jesus was a confronter. I have people today say, well, you know, two things you shouldn't confront. It's not our job. 
Number two, stay out of politics. Well, why don't you tell that to John the Baptist and Jesus? John the Baptist, you got to remember, he involved himself politically because, in fact, he lost his head over it. Some preachers are not even willing to risk everything. We're supposed to pray for him. I do pray for him. Lord, save his soul and remove him. That's how I pray. Now, let's not complicate this. But John the Baptist looked square at Herod, but to John the Baptist. He told Herod, it is not lawful. It's a sin that you have taken your brother's wife, Mark 6, 18. Why don't you just shut up and let there be a separation between the church, the kingdom, and the state? How about Jesus? In Luke chapter 13, you know what Jesus said? He said, uh, they, the, the Pharisees came to him and said in Luke 13, Jesus, you better get. You better shut up. You better tone it down. You better censor your message. Because don't you know that Herod, okay, they already knew about John the Baptist. Don't you know that Herod is in power? Basically paraphrase. You know what Jesus' answer was? He said, hey, go tell that fox. I cast out devils. I cure people. And I'm going to do it today. You're not going to shut down my church. You're going to shut down my ministry. You're not going to censor me. And by the way, I'm going to do it tomorrow and again, again, again until I go to the cross. That's what his message was. Come on, preacher. Come on, preacher. Do you know what he was saying when he said fox? He wasn't talking about, oh, that, that, that sly guy. No. I've talked to Greek scholars. And they said, do you know that Herod, according to history, was thought to be a become the first hairy leg contestant? You know, you know, don't ask me if somebody's a male or female because, you know, I, I'm not a biologist. <laughs> Brenda, Brenda comes to me and says, what do you want for dinner? I don't know. I'm not a chef. <laughs> There's only two genders, male, female. God made them. Now, what they want you to think, you know, listen, you know, Adam was smart. He knew. He knew the difference. He had never seen a lady before in his life. Here comes naked Eve with woman equipment. It's how you know that it wasn't him. It wasn't another dude. It wasn't, it wasn't another dude. It was, it was, it was. And you know what he said? Whoa, man. That's what he said. That's what he said. It's in the Bible. He didn't do what some of us have to do when we look at some dude that dresses themselves up. We're like, whoa, man. Ooh. <laughs> Go tell that fox. John the Baptist. Hey, what you're doing is wrong. Who, preacher, when Jesus came to the earth, the shepherds were watching over their flock by what? Oh, you mean when it's dark? That's when the shepherd goes into what he's been called in the earth to do, to protect you from darkness. And when you've got a relevant society and a woke culture shoving stuff out, the preacher needs to stand up and begin to say, um, excuse me, uh, 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 government, it's unlawful. What you're doing, you can impose on us. That goes against our Bible. You can call it marriage, but I'm never going to put man with man, woman with woman. God said, don't do it. I'm not doing it. I don't care if you've got relatives. I don't care if you know somebody. Amen. All right, let's go on. So, you, you got to, so let's, let's close with this. If I can have Pastor Doug come, let's close with this. I'm going to teach some more about this on Wednesday. You, you, you get anything out of this so far? Okay. Now, this is important because, you know, too much stuff is trying to, to get at the anointing. Too much stuff is trying to get at us. And, and one of the things that, you know, one of the reasons why, for example, Elisha in the Bible got the anointing in a double portion from Elijah because, listen, what you connect to is so important. That's why, read anointed books. Listen to anointed tapes. You know, I've been around great generals of the faith in my, in my I don't know how many years I've been in ministry, since 1986. Uh, I've been around anointed people. They've laid their hands on me. They've invested in my life. I remember when Marilyn Hickey first asked me a question, said, Hank, let's get in the Word together. I'm like, 
okay, well, what do you want to teach me? She said, no, you teach me. I'm like, huh? Uh-uh, uh-uh, no, 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 we don't do that. We, we don't do that. But what you get around, that's why in Joshua 3, when they saw the Ark of the Covenant, which contained the presence of God, God in a box, you know what God said? When you see that Ark, watch what he said. Put it back up. It says, and the priest Levi's bearing it, you shall remove your place. Sometimes you got to leave, go after where the anointing is. And that's why I am a believer of online membership and churches. And I salute you today, those of you that are watching. I pray for you, by the way, every day. All right, let's go on. I want to just leave you with this. So one of the ways that you get this anointing of preservation, can I, can I just teach you something very fast that is so important? It's what Jesus did. Anointed words. You have the anointed word. You have anointed words. Oftentimes when we think of the anointing, we only think of it in context of uh, transmitting of that anointing through the laying on of hands. But I want to teach you that there is, that's why Jesus spoke the word only. And the centurion's uh, servant was healed. You can... You can release the anointing with your words. When you say, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, I am anointed. You are bringing that anointing on your life. But there's something also called praying in tongues. Praying in tongues is what separates the anointing. One of the things that separates the anointing of the Old Testament to the anointing of the New Testament. Now, they spoke words. They prophesied in the Old Testament. But how many times do you read in the Old Testament before Acts where the Holy Spirit was poured out? It says that the Spirit of the Lord came upon them, and they spoke. But you get over into the book of Acts, the Spirit of the Lord comes upon them, and also within them. There's the anointing that comes upon you, and then there's the anointing that you have within you. And according to 1 John, you don't need any man to teach you. It's not saying you don't need teachers. It just means you have an inward anointing that can teach you things. you got to learn how to stir it up. you got to learn to, 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 you know, Jesus told a woman at the well that your spirit is a well. And it's the well of salvation. But then he goes on in John 7 and he says in verse 37 through 39, he says, out of your belly shall flow rivers, rivers of living power. That's what he said. And then it goes on and it tells you what he was talking about in verse 39. He said, man, I'm talking about the Holy Spirit. Even though he hasn't yet been given, but he's coming. And it's what's going to separate the old covenant from the new covenant is you're going to have the anointing or the infilling of the Holy Spirit within you. And every time you open your mouth and you pray in tongues, you are activating the river flow. You are, you are dipping into the well of John 4 that he said to the woman. He said, you got to draw up. That's why Psalm 42 says, uh, the deep, which is God, calls unto what? Your, your deep. Where's your deep? Your deep is your spirit. It's your well. And when you pray in tongues, rivers are coming out of you, and you are breaking open the deep, and you're pulling anointed words out of you, and you are praying absolute, perfect prayers over your life because the Bible says you don't know how to pray as you ought but the spirit with anointed language anointed words begins to pray through you and out of you and for you and part of that is preservation why do you think I just got a revelation why do you think Jude 20 says keep yourself keeping is preservation keep yourself in the love of God and in your most holy faith how by praying in tongues. When you pray in tongues, come on, on the way to your house today, you're, you're establishing preservation around you, around your car, around your life. Come on. Now watch this. Let's go to the Old Testament in closing. This is the last two scriptures we're going to look at. Genesis 7, 11 and Genesis 7, 16. Is there a connection of breaking open your well, letting the rivers flow, the waters flow and preservation yes whenever you look at the old testament you should always know that this is not a book of fiction or fables this stuff actually happens so when you look at the old testament the parting of the red sea or the parting of pastor hank's hair at the age of 22 absolutely happened amen so when you look at the old testament like noah and what we're going to see here where look at what it says here genesis 7 11 in the 600 year of noah's life in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up. Stop right there. That naturally happened. That literally happened. It historically happened. So the ground broke open. Water pressure 
busted up. All right, now, go over into the New Testament. When you take an Old Testament example and you bring it into the New Testament, how does it apply to you prophetically? Or how does that relate to you? Jesus said, out of your belly, out of your deep, flows rivers of living water. Correct? This says that the fountain of the deep broke open. So, what would be the prophetic New Testament example? Would be what I just said to you, John 7. So, the fountains of the deep breaking open in this literal historical example of Noah and the flood is your prophetic example of praying in tongues and breaking open your fountain, your well, and pulling those anointed words up out of you. Now, watch the next thing that happens in the literal example, the historical example. Soon as the fountains of the great deep broke open, what happened? Watch, watch, watch a connection, a connection. The windows of heaven were open. Now, that's twofold. There was a breaking of, of things that, that caused the rain to fall, but also there was a heaven, heavenly release. I'm going to show you. So anytime, this was the natural example, historical example. Fast forward. How does that relate? New Testament, us. When you pray in tongues, Jesus said, out of your deep, out of the fountain of your deep, right? Shall flow rivers of living water. When you start going, not just, I can't even pray like that. So I don't pray. But you pull something up out of you. And what does it do? It said here, the heavens were open. What do you do then? Fast forward in the New Testament. Well, God hasn't done anything in my life. What time the Lord said to me, he said, Hank, I want you to pray primarily when you come before my presence. I want you to pray in tongues. Constantly, Pray in tongues constantly. I did that for a season. And about six months later, there was all these blessings that were just popping up everywhere. And I said, Brenda, I said, whoa, man, God's got to turn off the, 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 the blessings here. I mean, not that I wanted him to. And I went to God. I said, God, you are just overwhelming me exceedingly, abundantly, beyond all I could ask or think. And he said, yeah, that's why I had you pray in tongues six months prior. Because you foreran what you're walking in now. Why? Because when you go, that's why you got to get filled with the Holy Ghost. You are, you are activating the fountain of your deep, just like here, and the windows of heaven. The connection to heaven is there, and God begins to do something supernatural for you. Right? Well, I don't have anybody that loves me. I want to be married. When's the last time you broke open the fountain of your deep and walked your floor of your house, of your apartment? When was the last time you got a prayer partner and said, pray in tongues with me over my future spouse? What's going to happen? The heavens are going to open. Now watch this. Look at what happens in verse 16. So they open up literally, historically. Man, I feel the anointing. The, the, the fountains of the deep. Heaven opens the connection to the supernatural. Now watch Isaiah 10, 27. Remember the anointing of preservation. Luke chapter 4. What happened to Jesus when he declared that the... Right? There was an anointing released. Watch what you read in verse 16. Watch what happens. After the deep was broken open or modern day they prayed in tongues, heaven got involved. Right? Watch what it released. An anointing of preservation. And they went in... Here's your two genders. Male. God commanded him. And the Lord did what? That's preservation. How come? God's showing you an Old Testament example of a New Testament prophetic principle. How do, how do you get God to shut you in? Well, first we can get you to shut up. <laughs> they can shut you in. Quit, quit speaking the wrong thing. Stand to your feet. But if he can get you to say the right things, get over into tongues, just like break open the fountain of your deep. He'll shut you in. There'll be, a, there'll be a preservation that comes over your life. How many of you got some out of this? And we are just, we're just, um, we're just skimming the top of the whatever we are. And we're going to get into it more. I got some more stuff to show you. It's good. It's going to get gooder. All right. You ready? Pastor Doug, take it away. Don't take a long time because I took a long time. My keys took a long time last week. But this is a revival church, so we can go. It's all good. All right. By the way, if you're cooking something. If you get an anointed church, that meal will be preserved. It won't get burnt. All right, God bless you. All right, take it away. I love you, man. Give Pastor a hand. All right, thank you. Thank you for his excellent preaching today. And our altar team can feel free to come forward at this time to be ready to minister to any needs that are here. Uh, but let me ask this, speaking of needs, if there's someone that may be watching today or maybe you're in the room today and you're not 100% sure that you've experienced that new birth that Pastor was talking about, that sozo life, the life of salvation where you know for sure 
that if something happened to you that you were to move on into eternity, you want to make sure that that eternity would be spent with our Lord Jesus Christ and not in destruction with the devil. Amen? No one wants that. So let me just ask you to be bold today. Is there anyone here? And you would say, Pastor Doug, I'm not 100% sure that I would make heaven if I was to go on to eternity from here on at this point in life. Is there anyone here? And you'd say that. I want prayer this morning because I want to make sure I'm on my way to heaven. I want to experience that new birth and that sozo life. It's a free gift that God offers us. Just like if I was to offer you this bottle of water today and I said, if someone's thirsty, you can come up and get the water. But God gives you a decision to make just like you make a decision in your life. Do you want this water or do you want eternal life? I saw a hand raised. Come on up here, sir. Be, be bold if that's you. Just come on up here. Anyone else? Come up here. And yeah, let him through. And we're going to agree in prayer. If there's anyone else, I want to give you time to get up here because it's a decision that's the most important decision that anyone will ever make. And I, I know it takes boldness to come up in front of a crowd here, but you know what? Who cares? Who cares what people think when your eternity is weighing in the balance? And it's so important. It's so important. Is there anyone else? I'm going to give you just a minute. Anyone else that would say, Pastor Doug, I, one man has come up here, and I want to make sure that when I leave here today, I'm born again, I'm saved, I'm on my way to heaven, and that I can experience everything God has for me while I'm on this earth. Okay, let's bow our heads, and I'm going to pray a prayer. I'd like you to repeat it after me. And if you're watching online, you do the same thing. You can stand right where you're at in your home or place of employment or in the hotel you're in or wherever you are, and the Lord can meet your need there too. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, I come to you now. Thank you for on the cross. He was buried, and he rose on the third day for me. Now, Lord, I repent of sin in my life. I ask you to forgive me, come into my heart, and make me a new creature. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So, sir, on this day, March 27th, 2022, you ask the Lord Jesus to come into your life and to be your Savior. You always remember that day. And uh, I'm going to ask you just to step over here with Solomon in the blue shirt. And he'll give you some information and pray with you and just make sure that everything is taken care of today. One more thing I want to tell the group here. If you are attending here and you've been attending for a while and you feel like Lord of Hosts should be your church, that's where the Lord's directing you to be part of. The Bible says in Psalms 92, those that are planted in the house of the Lord will flourish in the courts of God or in our uh, courts of our God. And what that means is if you're planted somewhere under a pastor's authority and anointing, you'll flourish in your life. And planting not only means just attend services, but it means doing what you can to help the plan of God manifest in that church's life. You're part of the body of Christ, and you can be that locally and plug in. We have a membership class coming up on April 7th, and those of you that are here in attendance locally can join that class and be part of Lord of Hosts Church, become a member, start serving, and then you'll see your life flourish. And I believe that you'll move into a new arena that God has, a new destiny for your life as being part of the anointing of this house. So the reason I'm saying that is today's really the last Sunday to sign up for that membership class. You can go out here to your right as you leave down to the information center, which is just across from the promise.